Great. So today's webinar will be focusing on patient navigation. It features speakers from four fabulous care coordination and peer support programs, uh, the Parent Partner Project, Parents Place of Maryland, the Center for Rare Disease Therapy, and Children's National Medical Center. In today's webinar, we'll be focusing on the needs assessment that calls for patient navigation as a sustainable, scalable intervention, a vision for the future. Representatives from these four models of navigation programs will be speaking on behalf of their programs, and we'll hopefully open up to, to have a great discussion with all of you who are participating in this webinar today. To be engaged, active, and well, individuals with complex care needs require support and coordination not currently embedded in the healthcare system. Individuals with complex care needs can include children and youth with special health care needs, individuals with genetic conditions, and individuals with serious or chronic conditions. For each of these patient populations, healthcare and the healthcare system can be a maze, difficult, or even impossible to navigate without a guide. Parents and caregivers, individuals with complex care needs, often with a daunting number of responsibilities, also require support and coordination. In fact, families of children and youth with special health care needs identify care coordination as their top priority. Yet ma many families do not have someone to arrange or coordinate their care. We know that social and emotional support are incredibly important for people with complex care needs and that they're not getting it, especially in the clinical setting. We know that children and youth with special health care needs are seeing multiple specialists along with health care and support providers that are often not in communication with one another. And we know that, unfortunately, much of the burden still falls on individuals and families with complex care needs to navigate these fragmented and complex systems themselves. As a coaching and case management intervention, patient navigation can bridge the gaps in comprehensive care that lead to these disparities. And partnership with a patient navigator can lead individuals and families to develop a sense of mastery and empowerment over their health within this daunting healthcare system. Across the country, individuals and families with complex needs have strengths and abilities that can be supported, addressed, and developed through patient navigation. Patient navigation is a strengths-based intervention, meaning that navigators can address what's working well to support the growth of individuals, families, and communities, understanding that people have existing competencies and resources for their own empowerment. In this way, navigation is allied with timely paradigm shifts in mental health care and social work. In past decades, these challenges have been met by the patient advocacy community, by initiatives in case management, and by individuals and families taking initiative to seek out information about their own conditions. Drawing from this diverse and meaningful work, a number of formal programs have emerged to address the obstacles faced by individuals and families with complex needs. Embedded in the healthcare system, programs and navigation have drawn from this foundation of support, coordination, and empowerment set by the patient advocacy community. Patient navigation originated as an intervention to help low-income individuals in Harlem overcome barriers to early cancer diagnosis and treatment through culturally sensitive care coordination and support. Through a set of coordination and support activities, the patient navigation intervention focuses on addressing and overcoming an individual's barriers to accessing, receiving, and actively engaging in comprehensive care. Since the first patient navigation program in 1990, 1989-1990, established by Harold P. Freeman at the Harlem Cancer Center in Harlem, New York. The intervention has been scaled and engaged to address disparities and barriers to care across conditions and across types of healthcare settings. To explore the basic functions of patient navigation for individuals with complex care needs, Genetic Alliance conducted a field survey of programs in coordination and peer support. For the course of the last year, we conducted semi-structured interviews with representatives from each of these programs, some of whom will be speaking shortly, collecting information about program mission, type, role, and responsibilities of the individual in the role of navigator, as well as distinguishing features of the navigator. The results of this research will be presented in a monograph that will be distributed in the coming weeks. And we look forward to hearing from our panelists shortly on their programs themselves. Thinking about the future, we know that individuals with complex care needs require a path by which they can become partners in their own care. Programs such as these 
presented by our panelists can provide the support, coordination, and empowerment deeply needed by individuals, families, and communities. Yet significant efforts have largely occurred within silos, as occurs often within the healthcare field. Multiple funded programs have carried out different kinds of evaluations, leading to data that can't be fluently compared. Genetic Alliance believes that the future of navigation and peer support would be well shaped by further research, coordination, and infrastructure to support and foster the best practices of programs such as those we will hear from shortly. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Brad Thompson, who will be presenting on the Parent Partner Project, formerly known as the Halley Project. Fred Thompson is the director of the Halley Project and the dad of a child with special health care needs. He has a master's degree in counseling from West Texas A&M University and operates private marriage and family ther therapy practices to go along with his work in the special needs community. He's been associated with Medical Home Project since 2003 and has worked in pediatric practices since 2007. Right. Are Brad? we are we ready to go? <laughs> okay. Ready to go. Okay. So if I could get you to go back one slide to just talk about uh, where it started, and the way the way it started was kind of a mutual frustration between uh, the Haley Project, which is our work uh, that was trying to serve families that have kids with special needs, and the difficulty of of getting audience with them along with the frustration of Dr. Sherry Medford, who uh, is a pediatrician in Amarillo, Texas, who was regularly referring parents uh, to our work, but they were rarely following up. And if you have a child with special needs, you can kind of understand the reality of that, and that is that uh, the to-do list for our families is always longer than, than our time would allow us to complete. And so, if you add a stranger and his phone number to the end of an already too long list, uh, that number's not going to get called very often. And so uh, as we talked about that in our mutual frustration, we, uh, we came up with the plan for me to just show up at her practice on Friday, and she would schedule well-child visits for kids who have special or chronic health care needs. Uh, for those Fridays, and then she would introduce me to those families as, as they, you know, as they came along. And and so the question we were we were really working to answer is how can we take the non-medical pieces of family-centered care off of the provider's plate? Because what we know is that while physical issues are what take you to the doctor, those those conversations often turn into how do I work with uh, my school system, what are the local services and supports and resources that are available, both traditional and non-traditional, and then, and then those emotional challenges that, that parents experience, such as, you know, in the early stages of this is just not the way it's supposed to be, or, or us being able to say, you're not alone in this, that, that there are people who've gone on this journey and may be a little further uh, down the road than you. And, and even the family issues that occur because maybe a spouse or parents or in-laws uh, just they, they're just in denial that there's really a diagnosis and a health issue coming not just uh, perhaps a discipline issue uh, next slide please um, and so uh, over time yeah thank you over time uh, we developed this idea and we continued to talk about it in different settings. We were blessed to be able to serve on a medical home project advisory committee for the AAP. And when we would go to these meetings, uh, we would always kind of have a roundtable discussion. And, and Dr. Rich Antonelli would always say, well, if I had a Brad Thompson in my practice, I would do that too. And my response to him was always, you do. Uh, you just haven't had the right lens to see those people. And what we found through work with a Boys Town uh, Child Health Improvement Project in, in Omaha, Nebraska, working with practices in their learning collaborative was that indeed every practice could identify uh, a parent partner that they felt comfortable with 
uh, working and bringing on their team to uh, to support families in those non-medical pieces that uh, the providers uh, neither had a ton of experience or expertise in, nor was that time that they spent with them billable. And so having a parent partner would allow them to offer uh, operate more efficiently, as well as providing better comprehensive care. Comprehensive care that went not only to the healthcare arena, but also in other arenas, such as education, uh, social services and and local community resources and so what you're looking at on your screen right now is is kind of a, an algorithm of how that project works and the challenges that we're trying to address the goals that we have in each practice and then how we uh, go about implementing those uh, those parent partners in the practices and and the biggest deal that I, that I want you to see is that providers identify those parents that they see as relatively healthy and who are willing and have the time on a part-time basis to serve other families who are going along the journey that, they're, uh, that they have already been on for a while. And, and what we have seen, and we continue to gather data both in in the state of Montana and the state of Wyoming where we have contracts uh, with the CSHCN departments in both states is, is that uh, one of the big things that we're addressing is the reduction of isolation. Uh, there are a lot of studies uh, being done and have been done that, that support the idea that, that isolation, whether it's physical or emotional or relational, uh, is one of the leading uh, contributors to both depression and anxiety in our population and and when you have a child with special needs it doesn't matter if you live in a urban suburban or very rural area you uh, uh, you have a tendency to become isolated just because your way of life is so different than your neighbors and your peers next slide please so benefits of the of the parent partner model are pretty uh, we think good, but also simple. The first is that we reduce the cost of the listening ear. By being able to hand off these non-medical conversations to a person who's trained and supported and uh, has personal and uh, personal expertise, we're able to reduce the number of unbillable hours for providers. And uh, by having these conversations, we are told in multiple settings that parent partners actually pay for themselves. Uh, what we have learned through our experience over the last eight years is that moms will tell another mom that they trust things that they would never share with anyone else, especially professionals because of a perceived judgment or, or, or stuff like that. And so uh, having that information available uh, to physicians gives them an insight into a world that in most cases you wouldn't get otherwise. Uh, parent, third, parents with experience in the world of special needs know who to talk to, not just what number to call. And that saves everyone time. We, we know who's most helpful at the Social Security office or the Medicaid office or even at, at your local school system because we've had to navigate all of those, all of those places. And, and so not only does it save the doctor time, but it saves the family time because they get more service in one place at the doctor's office and they're able to navigate those other systems more efficiently. And then finally, parent partners are far more available between office visits uh, and that encourages better follow-up and follow-through with, with the care plan that the doctor has prescribed as well as uh, tracking down other services that would serve the family. And, uh, and as well, this can uh, produce better insight into a family's life because as we check with them regularly between visits, we learn what's happening in the family day to day where uh, as, as the medical team, there are a lot of cases where when a child kind of gets stable medically, we may not see them but once a year or so for a school, uh, physical or well child visit. And so the gaps can be pretty big in between time seen. The parent partners can stay with them, and so you can have access to to the challenges that they're currently facing. Next slide, please. 
um, the benefits to families are fairly obvious. It, it gives them someone who's been there. Um, it, it gives them someone they can talk to away from the doctor's office. It gives them support away from the office in other complicated areas of life. And it also gives them not only the where but the who that we that we talk to. And everywhere I go, I hear providers talking about the importance of these things. And, and I'm thankful that if your provider's on the line that you emphasize them. Uh, but I also know how costly it is for you. Um, building these relationships becomes the, the emotional support that many of our families need and lack, which, uh, which can be a primary uh, protector against burnout. And that's what we want to look for because our kids are, uh, are a marathon journey, not a sprint. And so keeping parents healthy for the long run is very, very important. Uh, next slide and last slide for me. Uh, the benefits to the providers, number one, it reduces the cost of the listening ear because you can hand those conversations off. Number two, it allows you to spend more time at the top of your license and that's the work that provides the greatest job satisfaction. And, and third, you know, what are those things that you do regularly that are time consuming and, re and not reimbursable? A parent partner can allow you to hand many of those things off to somebody whose time is um, is much more free and available and, and allows you to continue to see patients and provide your expertise to them. Uh, if you have any more questions or have some questions about the work that we're doing, we'd like to talk more. Uh, all of my contact information is on that first slide and you're more than welcome to ask questions down here in the chat box. Uh, that's all for me. I'll turn it over uh, back to Sarah and go to the next, uh, next good work. Thanks, Brad. We do encourage attendees to ask questions using the uh, dialog box, and at the, end, um, at the end of the webinar, we'll be addressing them for discussion. Next, I would love to introduce Patty Archuleta from Parents Place of Maryland, where she serves as Family to Family Health Information Center Project Coordinator and Medical Home Parent Partner Program Coordinator. Patty is active on a variety of state and federal initiatives to improve services, family support, and parent professional partnerships related to health programs and policy for children with special health care needs. Patty's experience in pediatric practice quality improvement, behavior intervention, program development, and implementation. And she is also the parent of a young man with an autism spectrum disorder and a history of epilepsy. So I'll give a warm welcome to Patty Archuleta. Thanks, Patty. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. This is a, we are part of the Parents Place of Maryland who serve as our State Parent Training and Information Center, as well as our Family to Family Health Information Center. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our parent partner initiative uh, came about as a result of two, or rather three, quality improvement learning collaboratives that were put into place to improve care among pediatric practices in Maryland. One of those was the autism and developmental, so this is for children and youth with autism and developmental disabilities, focusing on screening and beyond. The other was for children and youth with epilepsy and other seizure disorders, enhancing primary care. And our third uh, learning collaborative involved Maryland transitioning youth with epilepsy and or autism. Next slide. That project was a result of a partnership. We were funded from the Maternal Child Health Bureau through HRSA. We also partnered with all of those folks you see on the screen there, including uh, Johns Hopkins, our uh, Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, our state Title V, the good folks in quality improvement over at Children's National, our Maryland Pediatric Improvement Partnership, 
as well as our content experts, the Epilepsy Foundation of the Chesapeake Region Abilities Network and Pathfinders for Autism. Next slide. So the benefits, as uh, as Brad was mentioning just a moment ago, the practices we have found enjoy the input regarding the challenges that families experience. Those, um, you know, those little disclosures that families have amongst themselves. They also enjoy the meaningful family engagement and having that continuous support and feedback. And they feel they benefit greatly from having all the information on the community and state resources that are available. As the family, state family to family health information center and as our Maryland Family Voices, we feel strongly that the family voice is so important to be represented at the table for all children and youth with special health care needs and our families benefit from this within this initiative. Um, the families that are being served benefit from the targeted case management system navigation and all of that additional support and as a result they feel very empowered. Um, overall, systemically, and all the parties in, enjoy the improved communication and partnership between the staff, and data consistently show that this results in better health outcomes for the children and the families. Next slide, please. So our model of uh, achieving a parent, recruiting parent partners into the pediatric practices was to, we studied several different models and the model that we built, we recruited, hired, and placed our parent partners um, by an outside organization, which was ourselves, into the medical practice as opposed to sourcing the parent partners from within the practice. And there was, a, that was a targeted approach because of the disparate regions within our small state, we have um, some challenges geographically. And so we sourced some of our own trained leaders from those communities. Um, they are paid, we believe in paying parents for their time. And this is a short-term grant funded project for three years. Our parent partners work often in more than one practice on three separate initiatives, and they are full partners in these quality improvement learning collaboratives. In addition to providing uh, the family support, they're also assisting with developing care plans and working on PDSA cycles. Next slide. Parent partners are amazing veteran parents of children and youth with special health care needs, they have a very rich and valuable perspective because of their experiences. Um, as you can see, I'm not going to read this to you, they have all of these amazing aspects and they are able to take that expertise they have in navigating complex health care systems and put that together and put it to good work in the community with their practices and with other families. Um, our parent partners, when we recruited, we were amazed to find the caliber of people who applied for the positions. There were so many um, who had amazing experience in a career prior to becoming family of a child with special health care needs. We had attorneys and MDs. We had several registered dietitians, highly qualified um, individuals, and they have been able to repurpose their work and their knowledge into serving other families. Next slide. Don't worry, they were well trained. This is some of the uh, training curriculum that we offered to the parent partners. It was very intensive. We started with a weekend intensive, two and a half days, and they also received a lot of ongoing training and men mentorship, guidance, and supervision um, in the forms of lectures and webina webinars, as well as informal discussions and calls amongst our, our small team. Next slide. Whoops. Next slide. Thank you. As I mentioned, as part of the Quality Improvement Learning Collaborative, uh, our particular parent partners had a different 
capacity outside of just family support. They were also the family voice in the part of a medical home quality improvement team. So they did work on specific um, improvement activities within the practice and had duties that included um, collecting and reporting data and administering instruments such as the medical home index. Now, we found within this quality improvement initiative that sometimes the medical practices were uh, not having full buy-in at the front end of having a parent partner, a parent in their practice. They had signed on as a large part to receive um, CMEs and MOCs within a quality improvement learning collaborative. And the parent partner was a bonus, a value added for them. And so there were at times some challenges uh, with overcoming just some thoughts or fears really that, that were had by some of the practitioners. And those were able to be allayed over time as they saw the benefit of working with the parent partners. Could we go to the previous slide, please? Thanks. So when a physician wants to refer to one of our uh, parent partners, they would use the referral form citing their specific concerns and we parent partners would collect and de-identify the data so that we could help um, drill down on what the family's uh, needs were and provide linkages to help them navigate a variety of services. Next slide, please. We needed to be clear on some of the roles uh, for parent partners. They provide a variety of resources and systems navigation, as you can see. One thing that we had to be quite clear about was that they were not there to provide clerical help. As Brad mentioned, there are so many non-medical um, things that sources of support that doctors wish they could provide to their families, and that was uh, what our parent partners focus on. Next. We also provided back, uh, backup and support for referrals so that practices could get the word out to their families. There were flyers that were available for posting as well as uh, letters to be sent to the various uh, cohorts of children that we were working with. Next slide. We found the top concerns that were discussed by families involved education, special education, 504s, IEPs, um, emotional support, support for behavioral health, which can be particularly challenging, and referrals and follow-ups for everything from early intervention to following up with that specialty referral, and many families had insurance concerns. Next slide. So we come to the end of our grant period for this, incentive, this initiative. And we have had an amazing amount of success with our parent partners. Most of them, the majority of them, have been offered positions within their pediatric practices who will now be exploring the use of care coordination billing codes to help with covering the added cost of having a parent partner in their practice. They'll also be uh, using some of those transition care coordination codes, I believe, um, testing those with uh, the different entities to see if we can help move the needle in that regard. Um, we have, for the first time in Maryland, uh, been written into our Title V grant. We've been funded for three years to have more parent partners now in our state. Uh, this initiative will focus uh, specifically on collecting care coordination data and using that framework. And we have also uh, been written We've written for the new round of ASD grant funding, and we are very excited for when uh, that will be announced. Next slide. 
Some of our challenges did include data collection. As I mentioned, um, parent partners were sort of a little a value added piece of our quality improvement learning collaborative. We had written in certain types of data collection, but as the uh, initiative moved along, we saw places where we uh, could build in and will be now building in uh, different ways and um, portals for collecting data more effectively, um, specifically more impact data from families. Um, as I mentioned also, we have, we're a small but disparate state and some of our practices were in you know, more rural areas and I think we would have appreciated a little more face time. And at times when you are dealing with smaller practices, there were space, simple logistic issues such as a lack of space. Some practices didn't have Wi-Fi or were not yet having um, transitioned to electronic health records. Um, I think, is that my last slide? I think that's my last slide. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box um, for later in the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Next, I'd like to introduce Jody Vento. Jody comes to us from the Center for Rare Disease Therapy at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where um, she also uh, manages, um, she also serves as a manager at the Brain Care Institute and Laboratory Genetic Counseling Program. Jody Vento graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a BS in Biological Sciences and Psychology and attended the University of Maryland School of Medicine um, to study genetic counseling. She has worked for several years as the genetic counselor and program coordinator for the Neurogenetics Clinic at Children's National Medical Center in DC and began working at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in 2012. Um, let's give a warm muted welcome to Jody Vento. Take it away, Jody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so you can move on to the next slide. So my, my background is actually as a genetic counselor, and I'm hoping that I can offer some perspective about um, how, how a large hospital system and academic center sort of views and incorporates patient navigation. Um, we are, we, this is a work in progress, <clears throat> and so we're a growing program, but it's been really nice to work in a hospital that has really valued the importance of a program like this. So several years ago, this actually happened pretty serendipitously, but we, we had um, been sort of at the forefront of some novel therapies for rare diseases. And a number of stakeholders that were involved with some of those um, those patients and from a hospital perspective got together and said, how can we do more of this? Um, you know, how can we, how can we sort of bridge the gap between patients with rare diseases and providing therapies for them? And um, through a number of meetings with a lot of different stakeholders, we, um, we decided to do, develop the Center for Rare Disease Therapy. And, um, and our focus was, it was and is on research, education, therapy, and of importance for this conversation, patient coordination. Um, and this is this is a part that I felt very, very, very passionately about because we could have um, outstanding infrastructure for research and education and therapy, but if patients don't land in the right place and if patients don't feel that it's a successful program, then it's you know, then it's really not going to, it's not going to last. So we focus on a handful of different conditions in which we have some sort of expertise at our hospital. And, and we work in conjunction with our patient navigation team, which is um, available for everybody else within the hospital. But what I'll be speaking to today is really what, what we've been working on within the Center for Rare Disease Therapy. Next slide. So this is our... Our, our mission statement, if you will, but but we we aim to have international experts that are focused on treating children with rare diseases, defined by leading standards of care, pioneering protocols, and individualized services. And one of the things that has been very important for us because of the multidisciplinary nature of what we do are what we call um, protocols. So protocols based on different diagnoses to ensure that patients are landing in the right place 
and um, you know when when it exists there's evidence-based practice to support what's happening and when there is no evidence-based practice then we're working to create that next slide so these are the core components of our program. Um, education, education we have felt to be very important and we do this in several ways. Um, we, we hosted our first conference this past February inviting a number of different um, healthcare professionals, physicians, genetic counselors across the region to learn more about what's happening for rare disease therapy. Um, and, and we also have have worked to create good marketing and website interfaces for patients, families, providers, those folks that may come to us. And this is something that we are always working on um, to, to improve the experience for patients and for providers that are interested in some of the, the diseases that fall under our umbrella to ensure that they have up-to-date good information. Research is also very important to what we do, um, and um, as I said, you know, when we don't have protocols for particular diseases, then we're working to create those, and we're also raising money to fund innovative therapies. When I think about patient navigation and patients with special needs or rare diseases, collaboration is just so essential. Um, and so we have a large multidisciplinary group that meets very frequently to discuss how we're doing, what we're doing, ways to improve. And we also have a number of external partnerships that have been very instrumental to moving our mission forward. And then, of course, and last and certainly not least, is, is clinical care. And so we've, the patient navigators that we use, or myself, and we are in the process of hiring another, um, are, are genetic counselors. And the reason that we chose genetic counselors in this role is because of the nature of the, um, the diagnoses that are coming through. And we really wanted to have somebody who knew the conditions that parents were calling and asking questions about. Um, and we help with everything from, you know, landing in the right place to appointments to um, accommodations and travel and everything else. And, and we've also raised some funding to help improve access for families that may need to travel and may not have the means to do so. Next slide. So the navigator responsibilities, um, we answer calls or emails quickly. Our goal is always within 24 hours. Um, and we feel that this is really important. Sometimes the calls are very urgent, but we also want families to be able to connect with somebody quickly, which doesn't always happen um, in other settings. And again, if we have a protocol or a pathway in place for a particular patient, then when we talk to a family, then we know, you know, which specialist the patient might need to see, at what frequency, um, if they need any laboratory tests or other evaluations, we can help get the ball rolling on those things. And, um, and in cases where they don't exist, we're working to create them. We also take time to connect with the family and ensure that needs are addressed. And this is something that is really, really important to me um, from my work and just working with families over the years, but being able to take the time to really connect with families and, and be a good resource for them. And, um, and it's, it's been great that um, our hospital has been supportive of allowing us to do that. We also gather records and we prepare a summary for the team, which is really helpful because when a patient enters a new medical system and they have complex health needs, they may have, you know, a box full of records. And going through that and pulling together a meaningful summary for the providers, um, we have found to be a really, really useful and helpful task in identifying anything that we're missing, um, but also in getting everybody on the same page. We help to coordinate appointments 
and and we also see the patients and family during their visits. I think that's important. So our first point of contact is typically by phone or email, um, but we do everything that we can to ensure that we are there in person for at least a portion of the visits, either in the very beginning or at the very end to help summarize. Um, and then we provide follow-up after the appointments. Next slide. So, and, and this is sort of speaking as a, as a hospital system, but we we have a dashboard which is just sort of how we track how we're doing, and um, and I think this is really important because for any program to be successful, there needs to be some sort of um, tracking of your of your success and your outcomes, and so you know success is measured differently by all the different stakeholders. So for example, our chief financial officer looks at things a little bit differently than perhaps some of our parents do. And all of those items are really important for us. So we keep track of our referral numbers and our sources, the financials, we track our marketing interventions over time. Um, but we also review quality data over time and we're in the process of engaging families for feedback and program development and developing a patient advocacy or advisory board so that they can really help guide us as the program grows. And then of course patient outcome data is really important to see. Next slide. So some of the lessons learned. Um, I think that with any program that you start, engaging key stakeholders up front is really important, and that may sound very obvious, but it's not always easy to identify all the right stakeholders and engage them in a meaningful way up front, but I think that that is a really, really key component. And developing um, a mission is really important, something that everybody can agree upon that you're working towards and then outlining very practical steps to achieving those missions and goals, how you're going to fund them, how, how you're going to measure them. And then ensuring that your program is considered an important priority about, by your organization, no matter what organization you're in. And so for us, having a program that focuses on children with rare diseases is it is considered a priority of our hospital, um, but you know we've had to sort of work to get it there because we're competing with very big programs like our Heart Institute or the Cancer Institute where there's a huge volume of patients. And this is a very small number of patients. Um, I shouldn't say very small, but it's a smaller number of patients. And so, and so um, you know, getting this to the top of the priority list or close to the top of the priority list for your organization I think is really, really important. And then eliciting ongoing feedback is always really important. Being receptive to change. Again, that probably sounds obvious, but we've changed, we've changed our focus a lot over the past few years where we've been working um, on the Center for Rare Disease Therapy and, and incorporating more care coordination and patient navigation has been one of our big changes and in, in, in my perspective, one of our most positive changes. And and sometimes you have to be creative. And so, you know, working in a big organization, there are a lot of resources. And sometimes just finding what those resources are and topping them and um, eliciting help from people in different areas has proven to be really beneficial for us. So, so that's sort of the Center for Rare Disease Therapy in a nutshell. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation today. Thanks, Jody. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Michelle Jiggett, who has over 20 years of experience providing healthcare advocacy for children and youth with special healthcare needs. Michelle currently serves as program administrator for the Complex Care Program and the Parent Navigator Program at Children's National in DC. Dr. Jiggett has been with Children's National since 2006 and has managed the Parent Navigator Program since 2010. Additionally, she serves as the research coordinator for the Giving Parents Support, or GPS, project, a study that aims to examine the impact of parent navigation on parental mental health and infant outcomes after discharge from the neonatal intensive care unit. Thanks, Michelle, and welcome to the webinar. You are unmuted and ready to go.
We're experiencing further technical difficulties. Thank you for bearing with us. In the meantime, we'll address, um, we'll address one or two of the questions that y'all have sent us. Um, for our previous presenters. One question sent early on regards compensation and the Parent Partner Project, or HALI Project. And this question is for Brad Thompson, of course. Uh, the question is, how are your parent partners compensated? Do primary care providers pay the HALI Project? Or, so Brad, if you could hop on, hop back on the call, we would love to hear um, for your response to this question while we're figuring out the muting situation with Michelle Jiggins. No problem. So in the practice that we support uh, in Utah, the uh, primary care provider uh, pays the parent partner just through the, uh, the reimbursements that she receives from providing care. In, uh, in the states of Wyoming and Montana, we have contracts with the Title V CSHPN uh, programs where they uh, they provide that as a as a means of of care coordination and case management support, especially in practices that are that are smaller, more rural, and don't have access to those types of services. And uh, they they see that it's uh, that it's been beneficial, it's been very cost effective, and uh, over over a long range, it actually uh, they start to see cost savings. Because families who have a parent partner committed to hospitals or show up in emergency rooms for acute care, so um, uh, those are those are ways that that it can be paid for. Thanks, Brad. Sure. Another question um, coming from the attendees. Um, and I'll, I'll send this one to Jody Vento, though we would love to hear feedback from each of the panelists. What would you say the ideal ratio of navigator or parent partner to patients or families is? And are there specific training programs or degrees across the country that would best prepare one to work in the field of patient navigation or care coordination? That's a really great, great question. I would say in, um, in my experience, in the patients that I've been working with, um, no more than 20 patients per month um, per navigator in order to really be able to do things well. Um, and that's if the navigator's sole job is to help navigate. Um, and so I, I think that would vary depending on the diagnoses too. And so the patients that are coming in to see us are often having... Hello? Um, oh. Hello? I'm sorry. Continue on. I finally am on. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Good. Oh, good. I'll answer quickly. I would say that the patients that are coming in to see us are often having very complex procedures like bone marrow transplants and things like that. And so um, perhaps our number is smaller than other places. Um, and I think that there's a number of different professionals that are good in that role. I think it depends on one's experience. I think using parents is wonderful. Um, but I think that, you know, social workers, certainly genetic counselors, um, and, and I don't know if anybody else has any other suggestions for other degrees that could be helpful in this space. Thanks, Jody. Um, because we are so time restricted at this point, we would love to have Michelle hop on and, um, and speak about the program at Children's National. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. I apologize. I don't know what actually happened. I was hearing everything, and then when I tried to do my presentation, I could not um, hear. But I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you to Genetic Alliance for allowing us to be able to share our program. You can change the slide. So our parent navigators, they're bridging gaps between patients and families in our health care system. Next. The Parent Navigator Program was founded in 2008 by Dr. Kara Bitto, who is the medical director of our Children's Health Center, one of our largest primary care sites located here at the hospital. 
um, she was looking to identify a better system to provide support to our pediatricians so that they could provide more comprehensive services to our families of children with special needs. And she realized that our providers were not fully aware of the community resources, nor did they have the adequate time or experience to identify these resources. And so she submitted some proposals to the District of Columbia where we received our initial startup support from uh, D.C. Department of Health through the Office of Community Health Administration. And we later received support from Maryland's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Office of Genetics and People with Special Health Care Needs, so that we could better serve our residents in Maryland. We continue to receive this grant funding um, from both of these entities to support our program, which has been um, a challenge um, in terms of maintaining our program. The uniqueness of our program is that our navigators are parents of children with special needs, and they have a wealth of knowledge and information that they are willing to share with other families. And so they provide this peer-to-peer -peer support in our hospital setting, and they also help our families identify community resources so that all our other families who come into our system have a place to go to to receive these community supports. And these are residents that are residing in the district um, of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia. The services that we provide, they are customized. They are based on the individual needs of our families, and these may be identified by the pediatrician, they may be identified by the family, or even by the navigator, because the navigator routinely does needs assessments on our families to identify what type of services that they need. Next slide. Our objective is to provide non-medical assistance and support to families of children with chronic medical conditions and special health care needs. We seek to inform, educate, support, and advocate for families of children with special health care needs. And we empower families to be strong partners with their providers, ultimately becoming a legacy family. And this simply means that families have obtained the necessary tools and resources to share and pass on to their other families. So currently, we are beginning to do a pilot where we're going to be assessing a family journey assessment, um, identifying where pam parents are when they first come into the program to where they are and evaluating them three months, six months out so that we know that we are helping them move through these milestones to become legacy families. Next slide. This is our team. Um, initially, we started out with two part-time navigators who were instrumental in laying the foundation for the program. And due to our increased demand, the program has now grown to six full-time navigators, two of whom of them are bilingual. All of our parent navigators are employees, they're hospital employees, fully benefited, and they are an integral part of our healthcare team in our primary care department as well in our complex care department. They serve in six of our NCQA level three certified medical homes that are um, located throughout the District of Columbia. And I just want to add that in FY15, our navigators, they're they do such a superb job that they provide a comprehensive navigation services to close to 500 families, and they resolve almost nearly 1,000 issues. And these issues can range from anything from housing to needing um, utility assistance to food assistance, child care, um, housing. Um, so they have really, they work really, really hard in making sure our families are receiving these services. Next slide. Navigators' roles and responsibilities are based on the requests that are um, primarily made by the pediatrician and, of course, a family needs. Our navigators, as I mentioned earlier, they provide that peer support. However, but they do provide a listening ear. You know, they allow our families to um, express their levels of frustration. They um, receive information that they would not routinely provide to the pediatrician 
pediatrician. And so our navigators have the, the wherewithal to give them some direction on how to resolve some of those issues and concerns. They coach families on advocacy, how to make appointments or how to arrange for transportation. They help them to communicate more effectively with their health care providers. They link them to community resource, resources, as I've already mentioned. And they assist them with educational needs, helping them making sure that they know what to say in IEP meetings or IFSP uh, meetings and making sure that the services are on those um, plans when they're being developed. They follow them to ensure that needs have been addressed. And in doing this, they disseminate tools that we have developed, um, which is our care notebook. Uh, we disseminate that to all of our families who come into the program to help them organize their medical information and be able to share that with other subspecialists when they go to those visits. And more recently, we've increased our focus on preparing families for transition from adolescent care to adult care, helping them to identify the adult providers, discussing topics of guardianship because this is a major issue for them, as well as a costly issue, and scheduling um, their initial adult primary care providers. Next slide. This diagram demonstrates that the navigator is a key component of the health care delivery team for the families of children that we serve here at Children's National, and they typically interact with each other and every one of these entities in a collaborative fashion. The physician may make a referral and ask them to, to work with the case manager, the insurance case manager, or they may help them identify um, therapists in the community for them to go to. So they do work collaboratively with everyone on, on, on the um, health care delivery team. Next slide. You have the next slide. Hello? Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. One moment. Okay. 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 Um, we disseminate uh, patient satisfaction surveys on a bi-monthly basis, and we routinely receive high satisfaction rates in upwards of 95%. A lot of our families feel that um, the service that we provide is extremely helpful and that they, in fact, would recommend it to other families that they come encounter with. However, you know, we have had some difficulties in being able to examine outcome measures, and so we participate in, um, in efforts to better examine our outcome measures. And so we're involved in two research projects. One is a REACH, a REACH project, which involves second and third year residents who have been evaluating our utilization and effectiveness of our parent navigator program. And secondly, we're in, engaged in the PCORI funded research project, which is the GPS project that Sarah mentioned earlier, giving parents support, evaluating the impact of parent navigation on mental health of caregivers of infants being discharged from the neonatal intensive care unit. And the principal investigators on this project are Dr. Karen Frantoni, who's the medical director of our complex care program, as well as Dr. Lisa Tuckman, one of our directors in our adolescent department here at Children's National. Next slide. Some lessons learned and barriers that we have encountered over the last few years is one is being able to continually identify funding on a yearly basis. Two is being able to build an infrastructure. You know, we have challenges in streamlining our data capturing systems. We currently document in two different databases. One is our electronic medical record system. So that is so that our navigators can communicate more effectively with our pediatricians and keep them abreast of what's going on and the information that they um, receive from the families. They document that into that database. But we also have a database strictly for our navigators where they put more information in to help other navigators work with our families 
families more closely. Um, periodically, we have to do um, staffing schedule changes and making modifications so that we can meet the needs of our families. Standardizing parent navigation throughout the hospital is one of our primary goals. Uh, currently, there are a couple different versions of navigation in our institution, and we would really like to centralize that. Another barrier is maintaining professional boundaries. Um, we routinely remind our providers as well as our navigators that our navigators are not social workers or case managers, but they are parents of children with special needs and they bring a different type of expertise to our families. Overcoming communication barriers such as inequities in language interpretation, insensitivity to literacy levels or even lack of understanding the different cultural differences. We have a large Hispanic and Amharic speaking population here, and so we want to make sure that we are addressing their needs from a cultural perspective as well. Maintaining flexibility for navigators who themselves have children at home with special health care needs because they still have to be able to advocate for their own child. So allowing them that flexibility we think is key um, to our program. Um, it's key to our program, but it can as well be a barrier for other um, programs. Uh, lack of continuing education or certification programs for parent navigation. And then lastly, integrating social media, being able to communicate more effectively through alternate means of communication. And our last slide. These are some distinguishing features. Our parent navigators are 100% benefited hospital employees. And as a benefit, as I just mentioned, we allow for flexibility. We don't want navigators to have to um, be faced with losing their job or their place of employment because they have to make the decision of going to an appointment for their own child. Navigators are fully integrated in our medical home healthcare team, they are a part of our team. They are not looked upon as parents. They are trusted by our providers. Our providers um, rely on them heavily to provide the emotional support um, that our families need. And then also our providers feel that they are more effective in caring for our children with special needs because of our navigators. Navigators actively participate in leadership and hospital committee meetings, and they are able to communicate parents' perspectives. So they participate on committees such as the Patient and Family Advisory Council, our Ethics Committee, our Older Patients Committee, our Wayfinding Committee, and these are just to name a few, but they are integrated into our whole health care system here at Children's National as well as in our primary care department. Our families develop trust and become comfortable with their navigator. There are times when the navigator tends to discuss things with them that they would not routinely discuss with their, their uh, doctors. And lastly, developing legacy families, helping families to become better advocates for their child. And that's it. I think I did that in a short period of time. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle, and, and thank you to all of our panelists and to those of you who are still attending the webinar in spite um, of the fact that it is now 1.09 p.m. We understand that you have busy schedules and we very deeply appreciate your active participation um, and or viewing um, of this webinar. The contact information of our presenters as well as um, my contact information here at Genetic Alliance are available here. Um, the slides and recording of this webinar will be available um, on the Genetic Alliance website and on our YouTube channel. Um, any and all questions that you've submitted that have not been answered will be sent along to presenters and we will be in direct contact to respond to those questions. Um, we would love to open this webinar up to discussion now, however, because of the time constraints, um, we will only be able to um, interact in that way in that particular way. Thank you so much for attending this call and thanks again to our panelists for participating. We deeply appreciate 
um, your involvement in this ongoing conversation. And we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks again. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. That was fantastic.